Welcome to today's episode of The Square. This week we're gonna be talking about the value of place. And joining me today are Lindsay Wilson. Good morning. Good morning. And she is our interior market sector leader. And we've got George Kaler, who is our New York studio leader. And the value of place has really changed over the last five to six months. So before we jump into that, I wanna kinda understand a little bit of background. So George, let's start with you. Why interior design? Well, for me as a designer, I really love uh, the technical and the creative aspects of my day-to-day -day project work. Uh, and as a studio leader, uh, I love working with my colleagues uh, and ultimately uh, creating office spaces where our clients can thrive. Lindsay, how about you? You wear a lot of different hats. <laughs> I do, but why design, you know, kind of at the core of it, is I just know that places matter and they impact how we feel, mm -hmm. how we behave, um, how healthy we are. And, and I just am going to be on that soapbox forever. <laughs> well, I don't think, I mean, again, coming from a non-architecture background, having been here for eight years, I don't think I realized the value of place before working here. And now I I can't go anywhere, even in my own home, without realizing that design had an effect on how I feel about that and w how functional it is, how efficient it is. So tell me a little bit about the value of place and what that means. Well, this time is so interesting because there's a new awareness about the impact of place as it relates to work. Mm -hmm. So due to the pandemic, almost everyone experienced some kind of shift in their working environment whether they went home to work or whether their environment changed because of protocols and processes that were put in place due to the pandemic, they experienced a change in place and work and how that made them feel as they tried to do their job every day. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, obviously the home and the office. Are there other places um, you know, in between those that were affected by this? Absolutely. If you if you can think back to before yeah. uh, coronavirus, we were talking a ton about the third place and the third place encapsulated a lot of places. I think Starbucks or the coffee shop was probably the most well-known, yeah. most talked about. So we had, our, we had our offices, we had our homes, and then we had all the in-between places. Yeah. Airport lounges, coffee shops, restaurants, outdoor spaces that A were park now- bench. <laughs> Park bench. That's now Wi-Fi enabled. So we had this palette of places that we were all doing work, collaborating, socializing, and the pandemic pandemic immediately separated this into two places. The in-between places went away. Yeah. So I know that wellness has been one of those things that Corgan's been focused on for a long time. It, it's not anything new because of the pandemic. But I get the feeling that um, it, certainly the pandemic has had an effect on both how we look at wellness, but also how people are listening to wanting wellness in their work environment. What, what has that been like, George? Well, I think uh, the pandemic really has proved uh, the importance of uh, the well-being of all of us uh, and uh, certainly how that is reflected in our, in our daily work lives. You know, we've been talking about well-being in the workplace for the last 10 years and now you know, everyone is understanding that is absolutely paramount, not just because of the pandemic itself, uh, but because uh, we know that you know, we need to be uh, in a healthy environment to be performing well. Um, and let's not forget that the, uh, the workplace uh, is there to attract and retain the best talent. You know, and to retain the best talent, you need to have the right amenities and the right uh, work di workplace design, uh, designing for well-being uh, to keep that talent. Uh, and we do know that uh, you know, the most diverse uh, workforces uh, coming together to innovate is what is making these uh, huge global companies stand out from the rest. I'm super interested in the notion of the workplace being one of your safe places. Yeah. You know, if you think about the evolution post pandemic, you know, your home and then how can your work be another place where you feel safe that the protocols and processes are in place and then how many things in your workplace can support your lifestyle. So lifestyle amenities that were already a big trend, having things delivered to your office, Amazon lockers mm -hmm. to pick up packages, you know, picking up food to take home. The workplace may start to do even more uh, work, if you will, around 
our lifestyle. Yeah. As we look to kind of limit where we go for yeah. a while. What trends are you seeing that were already kind of in existence but are being amplified? A lot, actually. So well-being, for one. Secondly, though, outdoor amenities. We were already seeing a ton of outdoor amenities, both in campus environments and high-rise roof decks in New York and everything in between. As the outdoors has become one of those safe places, yeah. we're seeing more and more immediate demand for upgrading or adding outdoor amenities. The next is supporting lifestyle amenities being part of the office. So as simple as Amazon delivery lockers, more complex to food that you can pick up and take home to your family for dinner. And I think there's an interesting notion, does the office become one of your safe places, if you will? So mm -hmm. your home, your office, and how many of those lifestyle errands or amenities can be accomplished in the workplace? Dry cleaning, grocery delivery. I mean, it's pretty interesting. Everybody wants everything delivered now. Yeah. <laughs> and it can be. We've all been spoiled. <laughs> I think we're going to see office buildings and corporations capitalize on that idea of convenience. How does that spill over into those third places? That's going to be super interesting. One of the things that isn't resolved in my mind is the evolution of food and beverage in the workplace, which was a massive trend. How much variety could you provide? How many different types of dining in an, in an office complex or campus? And there's still a lot of discussion around the next generation of that. How do we get more focused on self-serve, which people are comfortable with, less focused on you know buffet yeah. or kind of action stations, things like that, that we had in a lot of campus environments. So I think we'll see innovation around food and beverage in corporate campuses. So George, even before COVID, there were a lot of different trends that were kind of evolving the way we work. And I know in other conversations we've had, COVID's kind of been described as this great catalyst. Um, how has the pandemic affected those? Well, we know that this, you know, the pandemic really has accelerated and brought into focus uh, the well-being aspects of our work lives. Um, as uh, designers, we've been talking about well-being in the workplace for the last 10 years. Uh, we've seen some of our clients realize this as well. But now as we really see uh, workplace design becoming way more human-centered, uh, we believe that workplace design really must focus on the well-being of the employee, not just on the efficiency and experience aspects of the office, uh, but there are really some uh, you know, human-focused uh, components now that are coming to the forefront of office design. It seems like probably more so now than ever, you're having to really think about why people go to an office, like what the value is that an office holds. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it's really the, uh, you know, the human centered value of the office is now around the company culture. It's about building trust and collaboration. Um, and these things really add up to the innovation uh, that we know that sets uh, great companies apart. Uh, some of those uh, things are you know, the community engagement mm -hmm. with colleagues, uh, collaboration on various levels, reduced distractions. I know that we are all distracted at home uh, at the moment. I certainly am. <laughs> um, there is some regulatory uh, requirements for some finance clients, for example, of, of working in the office. But really, I think you know, the building trust with this face-to-face -face intera interaction with colleagues and clients is really what we're missing uh, being away from the office. Well, Lindsay, there's in that same idea of kind of having a value of the office, there's been several companies that have been making these proclamations about the future and their whole workforce, workforce being work from home forever. And tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that. Are they missing something? I have so many thoughts. <laughs> I'll try to organize them. So the workplace has always responded to changing culture, changing technology, changing norms and this is just another one of those evolutions mm -hmm. and so you can look back in any trend and and whatever company made the proclamation that they were changing something forever yeah is wrong 100 percent of the time <laughs> because the next technology will emerge or the next challenge will emerge and i think in working with our clients we've really talked about you know we're dealing with this first 12 to 18 month horizon where it's unlikely that we're going to have widely available vaccination 
for everybody. Right. So let's talk about what's the highest and best use of your workplace today. George just went through a lot of those reasons, collaboration, building trust, creating community, and how can we leverage your real estate today to accomplish those goals? And then let's look at the next horizon. What's the long-term impact of sure. remote work? What did we learn about mobility? Where did your individual organization really benefit and how do we capture that in the future? So I, I'm i very cynical about any forever <laughs> decision yeah. in any way. And as many companies as we have seen come out and say, we don't need an office. We've also seen companies like Amazon, like JP Morgan Chase come out and say, hey, the office is really important. And here's why. It's important to innovation. It's important to the growth of our individual employees and their development. So there's two sides to every coin. Sure. Well, and there's there's two ends to the scale, right? So to that end, is there is there value in looking at how companies used the spaces pre-COVID in terms of how they might use them for the next 12 to 18 months and then even after that? Absolutely. So what was working really well? Or where was your organization experimenting with how you were collaborating across an organization, across the country, across the world? What can you continue to experiment with and try before we rush to completely renovate the workplace right. for the moment that we're in. So I think that's pretty that's pretty interesting. George, I've heard you talk about if you think about this scale as, you know, the the extremes on either end, you've talked a lot about this concept of the fluid worker. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so the fluid worker really sits between the resident worker who spends uh, the majority of their time in the office uh, and those uh, that work from home. Uh, so this fluid worker, I think, is going to be uh, this new type of worker that uh, is going to be utilizing the office uh, and working from home uh, on a varying scale uh, to, to, to undertake their day-to-day their -day, uh, project work. Um, so really, the, uh, the office needs to accommodate uh, this, and uh, you know, this throws up really the, the importance of unassigned seats, of these collaboration spaces, of allowing uh, workers to be able to, in advance, uh, using technology, book spaces in an office, uh, to be able to communicate, collaborate, uh, using technology from home and, and remotely, uh, but also then coming in and utilizing uh, all that the office space uh, can give them. Yeah, so this is cool if you think about it. So if, you, if a company can embrace what their future workforce might look like now. Mm -hmm. They have an opportunity to build an infrastructure, some of it being a technology infrastructure, yeah. that enables that kind of mobility in the future. And then you've been talking about scalability. How do you step into the places that will support that future workforce? Right. Because you can't snap your fingers and make this change. No workplace transformation was happening overnight sure. and so I think now that the the panic if I can say that or the reaction to the immediate pandemic that we were in is fading a little bit and we're able to now start looking to the future and really talk about okay what do we want our organization to look like in five years right then you can start to build a program of projects both space projects, design projects, and technology projects that will support that. And we're pretty fortunate to have some clients that that's exactly what yeah. they've asked us to do. Well, and I would imagine there's some areas specifically, you know, with the Media Lab team, we everybody that's on the team has been around for at least four to five years. And so we already have that trust built up. So for a short period of time, being remote is not a problem because we already have the ability to work collaboratively because we have that trust built up. But if you're trying to onboard someone or do training or recruitment and that trust doesn't already exist, it, it feels like that would be a real challenge to do remotely because you just wouldn't get the feel of the culture. Yeah. I think George talked about that trust, building trust is a huge part of the value of a place because yeah. it happens in little moments. Of course, you have a one hour training session on a piece of software, but what happens after that? Yeah. Who did you meet in your organization that said, oh, hey, 
you went to school at Arkansas, so did I. And then you create relationships yeah. or who jumps in to help you out after the class. Yeah. I think some of those moments have been maybe devalued in the past of the importance of them. But then when they're gone, you really see them. You realize they're gone. <laughs> what the work that managers, I don't care your organization or, or industry, managers have been most impacted by this remote work, hybrid work, whatever state the organization is in, because the role of management yeah. remotely becomes so much more difficult in the practical organizational sense and in the connectivity, engagement, yep. authenticity, transparency, all of that. So, George, you were speaking a little bit earlier about some of the boundaries that happen um, or, or some of the distractions that you can have, especially in a home environment, and a, certainly a part of the consideration for the fluid worker has to be boundaries at home. I know it was tough the first week that I was working from home because I would, I felt like I needed to be doing a lot more, A, because I was at home, but also it was so easy just to stay in the office and keep working past when I normally would head home. Um, tell me a little bit about how you're, you're wrestling with the boundaries aspect of the fluid worker. Um, well, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, the boundaries uh, for fluid workers um, at home really is about, uh, you know, managing their own time, uh, managing their goals and, and, and being able to communicate uh, with a collective goal uh, within their team. Um, you know, I think the boundaries though that, um, that uh, our, our employers are going to have to take on is, is around uh, many aspects of, of who that fluid worker is and who they should be. Um, you know, certainly for hiring, uh, you know, there's a different set of skill sets I think uh, that needs to be defined for these remote workers uh, who will be coming into the office as well. Uh, you know, there's some HR policies uh, that need to set expectations, uh, you know, and training as well. Uh, we need to have the right equipment, uh, you know, at home, uh, improved collaboration technology, uh, you know, ergonomics in the workplace has been talked about, but, you know, having, having that at home as well is, is very important for someone to be able to undertake their work. Um, the remote working culture, you know, fostering a digital culture, you know, we've talked about that face-to-face -face, uh, connection that, Lizzie, uh, that Lindsay just mentioned, but, you know, that remote work, work culture is something that needs to be thought about uh, too. Um, and then, you know, obviously, you know, making sure that we've got the appropriate amount of access uh, and accessibility to an office space, as well as working from home, re really is gonna, you know, define some of those boundaries uh, for that remote worker. Uh, and for the fluid worker. Can you give me some examples? Because, I, and I get that the whole concept of fluid worker really is somewhat gonna be dependent on the client and what their needs are, but can you give me some examples of what um, f a fluid worker might look like? Well, uh, um, you know, a fluid, fluid worker uh, may be part of a, uh, an organization uh, that undertakes some team project work, uh, and they're gonna have to come into an office to work face-to-face -face with people uh, on, on particular projects. Uh, but then they're gonna have time where they need to uh, get their heads down uh, and undertake uh, you know, those head down tasks uh, that they need to perform at their own desk or in, in, in a private space. Um, and then so some of these um, you know, activities like the heads down work can be undertaken at home. Uh, so really the, you know, the fluidity, that, that word fluid means that these things are changing uh, all the time. Uh, so, you know, the office space needs to be able to accommodate that, that fluidity uh, and that change. It seems like it would also give a corporation or a company a little bit more agility to responding to something like the pandemic that happened. It, it seemed to come on so quickly in terms of the response and the reaction to how you were going to deal with your workforce. And this, having this already in place would seem like it would make that easier. Yeah, you know, we, we've seen organizations uh, that have a hoteling desk uh, system in place already. They're the ones that have been able to, to deal with this, uh, where you know, organizations have been largely uh, working in the office uh, with fixed PCs. Uh, you know, that's been disastrous during this, uh, this pandemic stage. So those that already have um, agile workforces uh, can adapt to this. Uh, and um, you know, we have seen some of our clients doing very well that, that have already have an agile uh, program set up for their workforce. Uh, but those that were tethered, that were fixed uh, to their desks, have, have had a real issue during this time. So George, as you've been thinking through the idea of this fluid worker, I know you're, you're going straight to our basic human needs and, and that you've really been using Maslow's hierarchy of needs 
as a, as a guide for some of these decisions. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, as, as we do really now focus on uh, yeah, well-being within the workplace, we're really taking a look back uh, at our basic human needs and, and making sure that the, uh, our workplace can accommodate those uh, basic human needs. As Maslow's uh, pyramid of, uh, of, of hierarchy of basic human needs, uh, the basis of that is uh, the physiological needs. We're getting that at home, we feel comfortable. Um, there's also the need for safety, uh, which is where we, we, we get at home. And we can provide that to a, to a degree uh, in the office space. But I think when we look at, uh, at some of the other basic human needs, that uh, the belongingness, uh, you know, to be part of society, to be part of culture, uh, we can only get that so far uh, when we're in our small family environments. Some people don't even have their families with them at home. So I think that's something really that the, uh, the office space can bring, that feeling of being part of an organization and a culture, uh, that's really important to, to human well-being. Um, and then we have the esteem needs, you know, to, do, to be doing well at work, to be doing well with, uh, amongst your colleagues, uh, to be getting that feedback from your management. Uh, really, we're not getting that at home to the same extent, and we really can get that when we're uh, in, in a fully functional workplace. And then uh, self-actualization, you know, really performing to your fullest potential. Uh, you know, being pushed, being you know part of a really innovative uh, discussion at work, uh, really pushing the boundaries. I think that uh, you know that's magnified when you're face to face uh, in your organisation. And I really do doubt that that uh, most people working from home now uh, are getting all these uh, basic human needs. So we need to allow for that, and we need to allow people to come into the office to be able to achieve all of those things. Because it's something that's so fluid <laughs> is there what's what are some of the questions that you ask to fit this model to be successful for a specific company well i think what we're excited about is diving in to help organizations figure out all the different worker profiles they have so there there's other types besides resident remote and fluid right. dependent on the organization okay so taking a look at where were you pre pandemic, where are you now, mm -hmm. and where do you want to be in the future? You know, this isn't, or this doesn't have to be happening yeah. to your company. You can make a choice yes. about where you want it to go in the future. And I think there's definitely been different people and different companies that have reacted differently. There's been very reactive organizations and everything's kind of happening to them yep. and then there are leaders emerging that are saying okay this is pretty interesting we're going to run with that we have teams that are being successful but we want to inject the opportunity for them to be together as george was saying at the kickoff of, at a, of a project or at key points along the uh, way okay um and i think communication is key yeah we've seen organizations who have lost credibility because of the way they communicated during the pandemic and we've seen organizations that have gained credibility because they were transparent here's what we know here's what we don't here's what we're going to try it yeah. may or may not work um, and so we're going to really see a separation i think the other thing george was talking about regulatory earlier are people who are tethered so much of what makes the media is about white collar knowledge workers who are pretty mobile. Yeah, You're missing all these regulatory issues with a lot of financial companies, a lot of the internet and IT security that companies are struggling with, what that deals with, innovative jobs that have to be done in labs with equipment for R&D. So we've kind of narrowed the cool part of the conversation yeah. to this one type of worker and when you really start working with a company there's all kinds there's of types of workers yeah. yeah which is why we love what we do yeah. it's always a huge puzzle the fact that everybody wants to talk about offices right now is the, maybe the only positive thing <laughs> out of the pandemic so what and i get that this is a really broad question considering um, you know the conversation so far but what what do you think the future for workers is and, and specifically from the human aspect what's their make George what, answer first okay George what's what do you think the 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 work situation or the quality of life or the fulfillment that people are going to have in this kind of time of, of things changing 
Well, I, I think, uh, you know, as Lindsay said, it's a really exciting time for, for office design. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, talking about this uh, human-centered approach to the workplace now, I think, uh, you know, employees are going to be engaged in a seamless experience between the digital and physical worlds. Um, which, you know, m meeting the hierarchy of basic human needs. Uh, you know, I think that's something that we've been talking about, uh, you know, and, and th that's a lot of those things we know that we can only get from face-to-face -face collaboration and interaction. Um, but, you know, in order for, you know, em employees to, uh, to be, um, you know, at the top of the game, uh, their highest uh, potential, uh, you know, I think it's really getting that balance right between uh, the human aspect and that digital interaction as well. I totally agree. You know, Gallup has been doing engagement surveys since the early 2000s. They saw one of the highest spikes in the ratio of engaged employees to disengaged employees in the spring after everyone went home. I think yep. it was perhaps their May survey. And they saw the biggest single drop a couple months later. And that is the direct result of this prolonged kind of separation, yeah. missing the social aspect, missing the community aspect, that now disengagement is as high as it's been since 2016. Wow. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Especially when you think about all the things that- they Connect us technology wise. Yes, yeah. and all the things that top organizations have been doing to get their employees more engaged. Yeah. Programs, amenities, wellness. I mean, we were living in this employee experience being like the single most important factor when we were designing new headquarters or workplaces to now the shift is well-being. Yeah. And what does that mean? We have had a client challenge us and say, how do we make our occupants healthier because they work in our workplace? Which is wow. such a cool challenge. Yeah, it's a cool that. Stay tuned till 2023. <laughs> well, it's cool. there's a company that's focused on that. All right, well, thank you both for joining us. I really appreciate it. I know this will be an ongoing conversation. And thank you for joining us on The Square this week. And we'll see you next time.